Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Digital Integrated Circuits. I'm Professor Adam Tiemann of the Annex Labs at Bar-Ilan University, and we'll now be going over the Kahoot for Lecture 1, Introduction. So, we have eight questions, and the first is simple. What does IC stand for? Integrated Computer, Inference Circuit, Integrated Circuit, or Instruction Computer? Well, it's Integrated Circuit, of course. And I just want to show you what I'm talking about. Well, the Integrated Circuit is one of the most important inventions in history. You know, the transistor was invented by Bardeen, Brattain, and Shockley um, a, num a while before that. But the big, big breakthrough came when Jack Kilby and Robert Noyce came up with this idea of how to make a complete chip on one, in one single monolithic process. So it started with Jack Kilby, who was a young engineer at TI, who um, on vacation uh, for most of the company, and he didn't have enough vacation days, sat in his lab and uh, played around. And he got to this weird structure here, which actually is a piece of germanium with a bunch of uh, different things on it. And... Uh, he uh, did this and it was a real breakthrough. It was the first time that they were able to take a number of transistors or a number of devices and put them on one silicon substrate. There were, however, a number of things that were missing here. First of all, how to isolate between the different devices. And you can kind of see these grooves inside here. What he did is he just cut uh, deep kind of trenches with a knife. And the other thing was how to connect between the different devices. And he did that with an external piece of, uh, of metal here that he used to connect between them. And that's when Robert Noyce, who was the CEO of Fairchild, later on became one of the founders of Intel, one of the, um, the uh, uh, traitorous eight who left um, Shockley Labs and, and moved to Silicon Valley and uh, opened up Fairchild. Well, Noyce was able to take this idea of isolation and make it uh, productizable. Um, he took a, an idea of taking a reverse bias PN junction and used it to isolate between uh, transistors. He also was able to take an idea of metallization and see how he could make the metal interconnects uh, again in one of these monolithic type of processes. So Jack Kilby and um, Robert Noyce are credited with um, in inventing the integrated circuit, which is what enabled um, scaling and what enabled what we are, have today uh, in, in our chips. So an integrated circuit, an IC, or a chip was uh, the answer to our question. Question two. Mark the incorrect answer about big players in our field. So first, TSMC, which we see over here, is a foundry or fab. Cadence is a CAD or an EDA provider. Intel is a fabless chip design company. And Apple and Amazon make chips. Which one is correct? Well, or which one is incorrect, actually? I guess it's that Intel is a fabless chip design company. So again, Let's go back to our slides and we'll see where we talked about this. This is the VLSI design ecosystem. So um, the guys who actually make the technology, the foundries or the fabs, there um, are these guys. I mean, there are others. This is just a, a bunch of logos that I took at one point. The big one, the big foundry is TSMC. As a foundry, TSMC provides the technology, makes the transistors, runs the process, which we're gonna, which we're gonna see in the following lectures, and they basically sell their technology to others. It's similar to a, uh, a printer who doesn't actually write the books. You have the authors who write the books, which would be these chip design, mostly fabulous uh, companies who write the books. They use some sort of a word processor or something like that, which is provided by the CAD and ETA um, uh, um, companies. And this uh, goes to the printing press afterwards, which are these fabs, which have the big machines that print out the books themselves, but they don't write them. So TSMC is what we call a pure play foundry, which means that they don't actually make their own chips. They only provide chips for others. While um, others, such as Intel, they actually have their fabrication plants inside the company. Company. And so Intel both does the chip design and does the production of their own chips. However, um, recently Intel has um, actually uh, announced that they will be providing foundry services as well, um, selling their, um, their chips to others. Intel also uses 
TSMC and maybe Samsung and others to print their chips. So um, they also are in that respect a fabless company, but they do have fabs inside, so they're not um, generally a fabless company. On the other side, we have the fabless companies. These are the ones who design chips, but they do not have their own fab. So um, all of these companies here, um, they uh, design chips. Samsung has its own fabs. It's actually a different part of the, the big uh, corporation. Intel um, desi uh, designs its own chips. IBM used to, but they sold their fabs to global foundries. Texas Instruments has some fabs, but they uh, also use TSMC and Samsung and Global Foundries and others to print their chips. But others such as um, Arm or Apple or uh, Qualcomm or Marvell or Broadcom, they don't have fabs at all. They're completely fabless companies. In the middle, we have the CAD or EDA providers and the big three are Cadence, Synopsys and Mentor Graphics, which is now Siemens. Um, but uh, these are the big three. There are several other smaller companies that provide different CAD tools. There are lots of CAD tools out there, but really these guys dominate the market. So that is our VLSI design ecosystem. And so going back to our answers over here, TSMC, as we said, is a foundry. It's a fab, a fab meaning a fabrication plant. They, they, they fabricate, they make the chips. Um, but uh, it's a foundry as it, as it sells its technology to others. It lets others print the chips inside their fabs. Okay, Cadence, as we said, is one of the CAD or EDA providers. CAD is computer-aided design. EDA is electronic design automation. When we say CAD, we can mean other any other technical tools um, that are used by different industries. EDA usually is really tools for VLSI design. So, But they're actually the same word, I would say. Okay, so Cadence is one of the big three providers of CAD and EDA. Um, Apple and Amazon are two companies who do many other things. I mean, Apple makes different systems. They make different software. Amazon, you know, used to sell books and they sell a lot of things as we all know and they provide web services but in uh, recent years they've also started making a lot of the chips that are inside them and in that in that respect they're a fabless company intel however is not a fabless chip design company it has its fabs inside so this was the wrong answer and that's why i selected it So question number three, what is incorrect about a fabless company such as Apple or NVIDIA? First of all, they design chips, they fabricate chips, they use EDA tools to design chips, or they write software. Which one is wrong? Well, in continuation of that previous question, it's obviously that, um, that, Apple, uh, that fabless companies such as Apple and NVIDIA, they do not fabricate chips. Yes, they do design chips. Again, they design their own chips, uh, especially NVIDIA. That's their core um, their, their, their core uh, business. But Apple also in recent years, again, and we all know about you know the, the M1 and so forth, they design their own chips as well. They use EDA tools to design chips. Well, all of these companies, they, use, they need to have EDA tools. Most of these EDA tools, again, are um, purchased from these uh, EDA vendors, but some things are developed developed in, in house, but they for sure use all kinds of automation tools to design the chips and they write software. Well, no chip is going to work without a large and uh, complex software sa stack. So yes, they also, in fact, probably the majority of the workers uh, in the chip design field are doing software in these companies as well. So let's see our next question. When we say CMOS technology, what do we mean? A planar, two-dimensional integrated circuit process, circuits that use MOS transistors, digital gates with a PMOS pull-up and an NMOS pull-down, or a digital process that includes both NMOS and PMOS transistors. So this one's kind of tricky, but the answer is uh, this one. Okay, so let's go back to our slides for a second. And this is CMOS technology. CMOS technology, as we can see over here, is where we have this type of a substrate. And in the substrate, um, I mean, this is just kind of a general picture. It doesn't have to be exactly like this, but this is how we kind of teach it. We usually take a uh, lightly doped P-type substrate, and inside it, we put these um, N, N plus type um, uh, diffusions and build on top of it, you know, a, a, a gate oxide and then on top of it some sort of a polysilicon gate or something like that. For a PMOS, we put an N well inside here. So there's an N type um, uh, doping that's done in here, which creates this reversed bias junction. And that isolates between the transistors. Remember that isolation I was talking about um, with, uh, with Robert Noyce before there. Um, and then we put uh, P-type uh, diffusions inside here and build our gate uh, 
on top of it, okay? So this allows us to put both NMOS and PMOS uh, uh, transistors inside uh, the same uh, substrate. And this was a big break breakthrough. The original, for example, 4004, the original microprocessor was made in a PMOS process. That means that they could only make PMOS. They took an N-type substrate and they put P-type diffusions inside. It took a while until they were able to actually figure out how to put NMOS and PMOS together and enable us to build CMOS digital logic. But when I asked about CMOS technology, I was talking about um, the technology itself, which enables us to make this CMOS digital logic, which usually uses an, a PMOS pull up and an NMOS pull down. Um, as we can see, you know, we've seen this type of uh, picture before. We have um, the stacks, the, the bottom layers are called the front end. That's where the transistors are made, the actual NMOSs and PMOSs. And then we have the back end, which is this metal stack that goes up with uh, contacts and vias and so forth until we get to the connections to the, to the uh, package itself. So this again is uh, FEOL or front end of the line. And this area is called the BEOL and back end of the line. Um, and usually the front end then therefore is the process of designing um, RTL, you know, designing your, um, your, your in Verilog or VHDL and doing all the verification. All of the logic is considered front end of the line because it's the first type and um, part of the um, process that we make as we'll see next week. And it actually takes hundreds of steps and a long, long, long time to make this part. Then we go over and we just connect between the different pins and so forth of, uh, of, the, uh, of the transistors that we made b below. And that's considered the back end of the line because it's done afterwards and it has a lot more um, uh, layers and so forth, but they're easier to make. And here we have, um, you know, a, a, a picture of this type of a thing and we can see one of these types of processes in, in a real picture. So um, going back to our answers to our Kahoot, um, again, what CMOS technology is, is a digital process that includes both PMOS and NMOS transistors. That being said, digital gates with a PMOS pull up and an NMOS pull down are called CMOS digital logic and it's enabled by having a CMOS technology. Circuits that use MOS transistors, well, as I said, that's not entirely correct because, uh, as I said, the Intel 4004 was made in a PMOS process. It used MOS transistors. It didn't use both NMOS and BMOS, but it used MOS transistors. And a planar 2D integrated circuit process. Well, yes, CMOS is in general what we would call a two-dimensional integrated circuit process. All of the um, transistors are made on the same two-dimensional plane, and therefore it is a planar uh, integrated circuit process. But there are a lot of planar integrated integrated circuit processes. Um, this is to, uh, different than what we may call a 2.5D process, which could be something like a, a, a FinFET where it actually goes up, as you can see over here, on top of the, um, of the substrate itself, even though a real 2.5D uh, process is when we actually connect chips through a third substrate, and maybe a 3D process, which either would be really building several layers of transistors on top of each other in a monolithic fashion, or just putting different chips on top of each other and connecting between them. And we may describe that in, uh, later on in the course. So question number five, what is an FPGA? A chip designed with standard cells, a programmable chip designed with generic blocks, a fully custom designed chip laid out by hand, or a generic set of transistors with a custom set of metals. Hmm, what would that be? Let's see. So I'm going to guess the blue one, a programmable chip designed with generic blocks. And going back to our slides again here, we talked about different VLSI design styles. And in the next question, we're going to go over all of them. But a field programmable um, gate array or an FPGA was a big breakthrough, actually, in uh, the world of hardware. Um, in fact, what it was, it was a, a development over the traditional gate array where we would make some generic structures and just do the back end layers to connect between them um, in a custom type of way. And this was able to save a lot of uh, development time and money and enable fixing things and so forth, but you still needed to go and uh, produce a new chip in order to change your routing between the layers. A field programmable gate array or an FPGA allows you to do this, um, you know, at home, sitting there and just connecting, you know, a, a computer and uh, burning in your, your new routing. So what it is made up of is a lookup table type of a cell. It's just a generic type of a cell, which has some sort of a block that can take, um, usually it's a four input 
uh, block so it can take any four inputs and according to what we write into the four inputs from some sort of a memory that we can burn um, we can get any function that comes out of here so basically you can make any combinatorial function of four inputs inside this loot and then we add an optional flip-flop so we can sample the output if needed um, and uh, so each one of these loots which are around here and you usually talk about FPGA sizes as the number of loots they have so we have all these these loots around here and what we actually need afterwards is some sort of a um, you know of routers that can enable taking the output of one of these loots and bringing it into the input of another one and there in that way we can cr create any type of a logic block including registers and so forth that we want um, in addition to that FPGAs have gone way farther than that nowadays and they have uh, different um, IPs such as um, you know different types of uh, CPU cores and different types of uh, surdeses and different um, um, different IPs that are pre-made and set inside there and uh, lots of uh, just memory blocks and so forth. So FPGAs are really um, important nowadays and what they enable us to do is really write in a, har in a hardware description language um, just like we do for ASICs which is what we're usually talking about in, in my courses and um, we have a set of tools that are provided by uh, by the FPGA designer developer if it's uh, Altera who is now Intel or Xilinx those are the two big ones they provide us a whole software software uh, stack that enables us to take our um, hardware description language, um, simulate and verify it, and then go and synthesize and place and route it on these FPGA. So it, it really knows exactly what the structure is here and is able to uh, configure these routers, provides us with this bitstream that we then burn into the memory that's on the chip and it, it, it provides the inputs to these loots and the inputs to these um, routers in order to redirect all of the uh, all of the signals. We will see in a, in a lecture coming up that this is has a real important um, cost versus uh, versus um, risk and and so forth type of a point for cost versus volume and risk type of a point for um, development of, of of hardware. So if we have a very few um, samples that we want to sell uh, or it's an initial just to get an initial product out we can use an fpga which uh really we can get things out for cheap i mean uh, we can fix bugs and so forth use it for development use it for checking our design and so forth before maybe then going on to an asic which when we're going to be selling volumes it becomes much cheaper okay so that's what an fpga is Okay, so going back here, a chip designed with standard cells is what we call an ASIC, an application-specific integrated circuit. Usually that's what we call it. Um, and that, to the, uh, different from an FPGA, we don't have those LUTs. We can go and put whichever cell we want and do the routing really by connecting our wires directly from cell to cell, not uh, uh, connecting our LUTs between, uh, between, different, between each other through these routers. Okay, what an FPGA is, is a programmable chip designed with generic blocks, so that's what we just saw. A fully custom designed chip laid out by hand, that's even a, a lower level than what we, we said here with standard cells. It's also a type of ASIC, but that's really using, you know, a, a tool like Virtuoso to go and um, draw our transistors and connect them, you know, with a layout tool. But that's uh, really a harder thing to do, and it's done mainly for analog and very specific, um, you know, blocks. And just to draw up your standard cells, you need to, you need to do them with a custom level. Okay, and a generic set of transistors with a custom set of metal, uh, metals, that um, could be what we would call a traditional gate array, not a field programmable gate array. So we would go and just uh, retape out the back end layers to, to connect things, but they're not as commonly found anymore. So question number six, what advantage does an ASIC have over an FPGA? Is its time to market quicker? Can it be fixed after fabrication? ASICs come in newer process technologies, or ASICs can be better optimized for speed, power, and area. Well, which one of these is an advantage? And the only one is this one over here. Okay, so again, going back to our slides, we have the entire pros and cons of the four design styles that I presented to you. So full custom design, as I mentioned a minute ago, is uh, it lets us to customize completely. So therefore, we can really optimize power performance in area. However, this comes at a high, high cost. Actually, we have to do it by hand. And doing it by hand is really complex. In fact, it impedes this uh, ability to, to completely optimize because um, it's hard uh, often to beat, you know, one of these computer algorithms that's going to just try um, millions and billions of different options, uh, but just by 
thinking, you know, and using our head, we can go and, uh, and make something better than others. However, it is a possibility and really uh, top designers can, can really beat the machines. It's just really hard to do. Um, so it costs a lot more because it takes a lot more time and engineering effort to design. The time to market is, uh, is very high because again, it takes a long time to design. And the, the, may, maybe the main problem here, well, I don't know if the main problem, but a real big problem is that it's high risk. We don't have completely solid methodologies that can verify that there are no bugs in this type of thing. And therefore, really, if we go uh, for a tape out and there was something wrong with one of our custom blocks, it's just not going to work correctly. And there's nothing we can do about it. So the next level up from uh, custom design is uh, standard cell design. And that's almost a custom design. You could call it a semi-custom design. What we do is we use full custom design to build just a, a, a bunch of building blocks, which we call standard cells. And then we can stick these standard cells inside of a set of algorithms, which you can learn about in my digital VLSI design course if, if you are interested. And it, it enables us to have a simple, fast, and reliable flow to make things. Um, when I say simple, fast, and reliable, that's all very relative because it still takes a long time and the process of, uh, of designing a, a, you know, a big complex ACE, it can take even up to something like I would say two years um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a VLSI company. Okay. Um, the thing about standard cells, it's only really for digital designs. If you want to do anything analog or anything like uh, different and special, you, you've got to do it uh, by hand. There are different um, options of automating things for analog, but really none of them took off. Most of the analog type of stuff is done with full custom design. Um, and it does have additional power and wire length, et cetera, over full custom design if you were able to you know, do the best optimization of full custom design. But in the end, for digital stuff at least, it's usually very, very, very um, you know, uh, comparable, if not much better than what you could actually do um, uh, by yourself. Okay. Uh, the problem with standard cell design, it still takes a lot of time to make. As I said, it can take something like two years to get a, a product to market. You have to go through a full uh, mask tape out, which can cost millions of dollars. So the next step up is this FPGA, which we talked about before. And FPGA has two really huge, huge benefits over anything else. First of all, it's uh, it, it has post silicon configurability. So once we taped out a full custom or a standard cell design or a mix between full custom and standard cell, we cannot fix it. You know, another, to fix it means to go for another another tape out and another tape out costs uh, uh, another ton of money and we need to you know do the same type of level of verification and validation and so forth it's a real mess if we have any bugs over here with an FPGA we just go and you know f uh, load in another bitstream and it reconfigures itself it takes a few minutes it can take longer than that for a real complex FPGA but it's still something that's you know done um, at home uh, basically as, I, as you can say so you buy the FPGA and that's your initial cost and that's all it is and the initial FPGA can cost a lot, especially if it's a big FPGA, but that's that's your whole cost. It's not like buying a whole uh, set of, uh, of uh, tape out masks, okay? Um, uh, that's the number one thing. The number two thing is you can really develop and you don't have to really verify and, and finish everything before going and trying it out. You can go and make things in hardware so you can really get to market fast. You don't have to wait for the fab to go and uh, fabricate your chip, which can take months, and then go and do this whole ramp up process. Really, you can write your, your RTL, you can write your code, and, uh, and load it onto the FPGA and try it out right away and see if there are any critical bugs, and then start verification, which can be the same type of a process, but you know it's not that bad. If you find a bug, you just go and fix it and, and load in another bitstream. Um, the problem with it is there's a high percentage of overhead. So as we see, we have these generic blocks. We have lots of them. We're not going to use all of them. We might not be able to fit our whole design onto the FPGA because there aren't enough of them. And also just uh, routing between the different blocks is going to be much larger, longer than just uh, routing inside what we would do in, 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 a, in a standard cell design. And um, so it's going to have a lot higher uh, power, a lot higher uh, uh, propagation delay. So we're going to get lower frequencies and so forth, but it's still done in hardware. So it's much, much, much software, uh, much, much, much uh, faster than our final design style, which is, is our software. So uh, writing software is um, it means to actually write something in a higher level language such as C and compiling it into a set of instructions, uh, you know, in assembler and then running them on a microcontroller or on, you know, a set of different uh, um, accelerators and, and things we have. But this is a very, you know, sequential process and it, it knows how to do a few things and we try to do something much more complex with it. It's going to be much, much, much slower 
much higher power and much less efficient than doing it on any of the hardware um, that we have up above. But then again, it's programmable in a high level. It's not a hardware description language. We use software, which you know all of us have seen before, and it's really easy, uh, relatively, to program, to debug, and um, to you know just load something else onto it. It doesn't take uh, even minutes. It can take uh, uh, seconds, or even with a debugger, do it on the spot. So really, um, with software, it gives us a lot more flexibility. But if we know what we want to do, and we want to do it a lot, and we want to do it efficiently, then we go over and we we make the hardware, and that's what we're talking about in this course. So our next question is a puzzle question. Put the stages of chip design in order from the first, uh, the first thing at the top and the last thing at the bottom. Well, tape out, we know that's at the bottom. Let's see, logic design, I guess that'll be a bit higher. After we design it, we better verify it. Then we'll do the physical design and then we'll tape out. Okay, so let's go and see the uh, where we talked about that. So this is one of several of these types of uh, ways of showing the flow. And again, it doesn't matter exactly how I divided it and how I wrote it. I mean, uh, different people from the industry can draw this differently. And, you know, if you ever did make a chip, you would be able to, to do this yourself and decide how you wanted to display it. But the general concept is, is what's important. And make sure you're not one of these people who your kid comes out and starts saying, hello world. Well, maybe you should be. Okay. So so we start with, you know, defining the chip. So that's, you know, architecture and algorithm and, and making a spec. So the spec is something that tells us really how uh, the designers are supposed to go and implement the, the chip and what's supposed to come out of it. So the designers then take this spec and they go and uh, drop the logic to it. In addition to that, we try to do as much reuse as possible. In other words, going and finding things that were already designed and verified and maybe silicon proven so we know that they work and just integrating them into our design that's going to make the process much faster, cheaper, and lower risk. So that's called IP integration. So we're going to go in and we're going to write our RTL, our, our logic, and we're going to go get these IPs. Um, sometimes it's, it's analog blocks that we're going to be developing now, but in any case, we have to integrate these IPs into our design. So that's the logic design and IP integration. And that's where the designer comes and tries to, you know, meet the spec that was, uh, the, that was uh, brought down to him by the architect. Um, However, uh, we don't know if uh, we did it correctly, and we always design things with bugs. And that's why we have this very long process of logic verification. And logic verification is, again, taking the architecture and the spec and going and interpreting it but not with a hardware description language and these hard IPs, but rather at a uh, more software level and the defining basically what we were supposed to do at the software level, um, creating you know vectors to see that uh, if our logic was actually implementing that and checkers to check that it was doing it. And so we have this long process of designing these things that basically attack our chip or, or toggle the chip or, or, or um, you could call it all kinds of different things and try to make sure that it does everything right under every different scenario and that's where we find bugs and basically go back to the logic designers they fix things and then we run you know our logic verification again once this is finished it actually starts way before it's finished but once it's finished we go over and pass the design to the physical designers who take that you know high level type of a language so what we have basically is this rtl which is uh, just a, a, a high level language you know and we have these uh, hard ips maybe these kind of uh, things that have a full layout and so forth um, and we go and try to fit them together onto the chip, which has a certain size and a certain shape and certain number of constraints. And that's the physical design process. That's the main, basically, um, point of uh, my digital VLSI design course. And once we finish our physical design, we sit with the whole team, um, with the manager, and he has this log, long, long book. And in the book, there are um, these different things that we had to, to meet. And each one of them has a place for signing and we sign each and every one of them when we see that we really met uh, and we did all of the different checks so we don't accidentally go to tape out before we checked everything once everything is signed that's called sign off and we're ready to go and send our chip to the fab to the foundry to tape it out so uh, that's to send it and go and fabricate our chip so that's sign off and tape out so that's the how the chip is born and that's what I saw here on uh, on our code. So we first started with logic design, then logic verification, then physical design, and finally tape out. So now we're up to our last question today. Which of the following is not a layout verification process? DRC, 
LVS, BDK, or RCX. So anyone who's been dealing with this for a while will kind of laugh here and hit PDK. So I just wanted to remind you of the steps of, um, of you know, physical verification here. And we have, they are the DRC, LVS, and RCX or PEX. So DRC is the design rule check. That means we get from the foundry, from the fab, we get a list of rules that we have to meet in order that they are able to fabricate it, okay? They can't make things too small or too close together. And there are many, many of these different um, checks. In fact, in, in nanoscale technologies, it can get to, you know, many thousands of rules that are really complex and they're even hard to explain or draw up in, in, the, in, the, in the, what we call the design rule manual. So those are design rules and we have a uh, process where we run an algorithm that goes and checks each and every one of these things uh, over our whole chip and make sure that we didn't um, uh, violate any of these rules. That's the design rule check. If we did violate the rules, we have to go back and fix them. Okay. Then we have LVS, which is the great name, layout versus schematics. Well, that's because we take the layout of our design. So we um, took a design, you know, we turned it into all these polygons that are supposed to represent transistors and so forth. And we have the schematics, which are initial transistors, what they were supposed to do, and we have to compare the two. Actually, at a higher level, what we're going to do is we're going to take our, um, our RTL, which was then turned into a bunch of, uh, of, of standard cell gates. So we have a gate level net list. Um, we, we know that the gates, each inverter is made up of an NMOS and a PMOS. So we turn the gate level net list into a spice net list, basically of all the transistors. We take the layout and we run over the layout and figure out, you know, aha, we have poly over diffusion here. That's a transistor. Look, it's connected to another poly over diffusion. That's another transistor. And we create a spice net list of, uh, of the layout. And then we compare those two spice net lists, uh, net lists in, a, um, in a formal way. So we make sure that each and every node in the net list is exactly the same. And that's layout versus schematics. And in order to tape out, we have to make sure really that um, the, the layout that we're sending is exactly the same as a schematic and I have a different course that des describes these two um, uh, these two processes uh, in depth how to do it um, that's called our full chip DRC LVS or full, full chip uh, physical validation course it's a short course that I have on my website okay and finally we get to parasitic extraction which couldn't be called RC for resistance capacitance X for extraction or PEX for parasitic extraction um, probably there are other names too, where um, we have a tool that goes over and looks at all the wires and looks at all, uh, everything in the design and figures out what the electrical characteristics are, what their resistance and capacitance and so forth, and um, actually back annotates it back to our, um, our spice net list. So we now have the real parasitics inside and we can run post layout simulations or, or um, you know, gate level with back annotated uh, timing and so forth. And we can see what the actual timing came out after we created the layout. This becomes more and more important as, uh, as designs, uh, as our technology scales because the parasitics get worse for all the backend layers and so forth. But we'll be discussing that in, uh, in coming lectures. Okay, and really um, kind of tools that we could use are like uh, Cadence has Ashura or PVS or, or now Pegasus. Mentor Graphics ha um, or Siemens uh, has uh, Caliber. That's one of the leading ones. Uh, 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 you know, um, Synopsys has Star XT. So each of these companies has some sort of solution for that. So um, as we saw, DRC, LVS, and RCX are the layout verification processes. PDK, of course, is a process design kit. That's um, basically the uh, all the transistors, the model files, the design rules, and so forth that are provided to us by the foundry so we can go and design our uh, transistors, our circuits, and so forth. So that was it for um, this lesson, uh, for this Kahoot, and uh, we'll be back next time with, uh, with our next uh, Kahoot. Bye for now.